Thank you. Uh, okay, so basically this is really good, uh, I think, description, who am I and what I do, but like, uh, let's say four or five years ago, I was more thinking about myself as being some kind of detective, uh, but not being so much professor or, or doing like this. So I felt like doing some kind of in strange investigations. And uh, basically it started by, by uh, one little group of mostly friends. So what we were doing, we had like a lot of different skills, but at that time we were helping and giving like a free cyber forensic that we are having in our hands are not exactly devices. They are more or less just interfaces or just screens that connect us to, to the machines that are somewhere else. So most of the time machine is not in our hand. This is most of the time some kind of sensors, combination of sensors and screens. No? It's the same with, with Amazon Echo device. And then if you go further from that device, this device is connected to another device. So this is kind of internet router that is, for example, in your home. And this is the second step in my investigation. So for example, with Kate Crawford that I started this investigation with, I started with the object, you know. But the thing is like this object doesn't tell you a lot, you know. So the second step is to try to understand how this object is communicating with the network. Then I was investigating the second dot in, the, in this, uh, uh, basically ex extended anatomy of the device and basically it's a router. Then what I was doing there, I was try trying to sniff all the packets and trying to understand what those packets are bringing, trying to, to, to see what is going out from the device. And then from there I went into the internet infrastructure, trying to understand where those packets are flowing. No? And basically investigating internet infrastructure, it's a really interesting story because it tells us a story about invisible infrastructure that, that basically can tell us a lot about power, how those internet service providers are, are connected between each other and so on so on. But also it can tell us about the places where other actors, so now we are not just speaking about us, our device, now we are speaking about many companies, no? different internet service providers. But we are also speaking about government because our government uh, is also attached to this network and government can also like interfere in a lot of different ways. It can censor, it can and can monitor, that can or also each each node in this network can do the same thing. They, either it's a government or it's like a private company. No? And then if we follow this like a kind of like a life of this like one internet packet or one packet that is going out from this device, then we are going through lot of different places, then we are jumping into some kind of uh, uh, infrastructures made of, of different data centers and different things that we don't see. So if we spoke yesterday and day before, yesterday we spoke about this kind of uh, hyper bodies, you know, where is this body? The body is basically not here, it's somewhere else. This is the body is where the computation is happening. No? But in order to investigate those places, I, was, I tried to, to go and to follow those packets and to visit all of those places. So most of the time it's some kind of gray, super big uh, uh, buildings that it's really hard to, to enter and really hard to understand what's going on inside. But those buildings are just like one layer. So each of those layers that I was investigating is basically another layer of untransparency you know, that you need in some way to break. You need to pass through in order to follow this really simple story, to follow one packet from your home to the place where the computation is happening. But then when you get to the place of computation, then you are getting into different uh, uh, troubles, you know, because like then the, the story is starting to be even more complex. And, and now I will jump to another map maybe complex in the same way as the previous one. So this is our research because in that moment we were like, okay, we understand the networks, we understand how the packets are moving and now we, we are facing some kind of black box, we are facing different kinds of al algorithmic processes that we need to 
understand because those processes are basically defining how we communicate, how we move through the streets, how we are doing a lot of things in our life. So this is when we started this like really big research called the uh, uh, Facebook Algorithmic Factory. It's to try to understand how this process look like. And, and, but also what was really interesting for me is to try to understand how the main business model of the internet today looks like. Because when we are speaking here about this strange map with a lot of crazy lines, we are speaking about some kind of a, a forensic analysis of the business model, forensic analysis of, of uh, uh, surveillance capitalism. And it's really hard to investigate this from your room. Even if probably in the same way hard to investigate, even if, if you are in data center, that they will probably not let you in, but it will be in the same time uh, hard to understand. So I started with the idea of immaterial labor. This idea of immaterial labor, it's something that was like really popular in the beginning of 2000s, and this idea every time when we are on Facebook or some other platform, we are basically performing a labor. So we are, when we are commenting or posting a picture, we are working for Facebook. In that sense, I try to understand how the factory look like. And this is the picture of the factory. And, and this is what is like really interesting. It's one of the rare pictures that exist of this like uh, algorithmic process. And non, not a lot of other crazy people were like into drawing these kind of strange pictures. But what I try to do here, I try to, to map all the ways we are interacting with this black box, in a sense, what we can do. You know, like we can like, we can share, we can check in, update status, whatever. So this is all on the left side. I tried to map all, all the forms of, of data collection that this company is doing. So for example, um, device information, because it's not just what we do, it's also what our devices are, are doing and what our devices are saying to, to, uh, um, about us and basically also like we try to map this kind of vast uh, universe of, 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 of data collection in form of cookies and trackers and all of these kind of things. And then on the right side of this complex map, I try to, to map how the product looks like. And we all know who is the product, product is basically us but how they are selling us, they are selling us basically tagged by different information, our age, gender, location, language, education, and so on, so on, so on, so on, lots of crazy things. So the first really st stupid idea was that I will be able to connect those two sides of the map. So type of data that is collected with type of information about us that they are selling. But in a way, it was really naive, and this is of course not possible, because there is a lot of things happening in between. And then we tried to, to do different kinds of measurements and stuff like this, but it was not so easy. In a sense, that the, the amount of data collection is so vast that everything you do, you open your computer, you type one letter, you already contaminated your data set. So it's kind of like nonsense to, to measure. Okay, from my you know, perspective. But uh, uh, then I found like seven to 8,000 different patents publicly available that are explaining some kind of bits of, of this mosaic. And I don't want to go a lot in the detail, but for me, cartographer, okay, this is my imagination of myself as a being cartographer. <laughs> Basically the core of this, this uh, uh, system and it's called the social graph. So what is the core of that system? The core of this system, it's a map. And this is really exciting for me. Uh, so what is, what is a part of this map is basically each node, a node it's everything, like us as a user, we are one node, the picture is another node, everything that we do bec become another node. And then those nodes are connected into one big network graph that, that is vast, like thousands, millions and billions and billions and billions of dots that are forming, interconnected dots that are forming one map. So this map is basically a territory. And, and then when I was thinking back on this idea of immaterial labor, I, I realized maybe this is not the, the end of the story because the map is a territory. 
how this map is created? It's created by extraction process that is extracting information from us, from our bodies, our movement, our behavior, our interactions. So we are here, low, we are some kind of like resource material that forms, and then you have extraction of, of resource that forms a map, that forms a category, okay, uh, territory. And then on top of this territory, then you have like a thousands and thousands and hundreds of different mathematical function, AI, whatever that is, or, or complex algorithms that are basically then exploiting this territory and trying to, to, to extract the meaning and trying to extract the profit out of this new territory. So we, maybe we cannot say we are the data, no. We are the resource for data that is forming a new territory that is then being exploited as a, as a new gold. This new territory is basically worth those billions and billions and billions of dollars that they are earning every day. So back to the AI anatomy of an AI system map. So what I was doing for years is basically this one vertical line, starting with us, and then device, then a network, then going deeper into platform, then infrastructure, and then algorithms. Okay. So I spent like five years just trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And then I had like one really amazing uh, uh, friend of mine, uh, Joanna Moll. She kind of like in, in infested with me with idea of materiality of those places, you know. And then I was, I was thinking, there is this, and also there is this kind of Marshall McLuhan idea of media as extension of our senses, no? So what I was doing, I was dissecting this extension, but then you have a Yussi Parika saying media as extension of earth. And then for me, that was like, woohoo, this is like a new, <laughs> new dimension. So I, I, what I did, and then I started to work with Kate Crawford from AI Now, because I, I saw that there is like a big potential in like dissecting this AI as a new whatever gold or whatever we can think of. An idea was this. If we have this line, middle line here, and then add time component, so put this in some kind of 3D in which the third dimension is time, and rewind all of those parts of infrastructure back in time, like 40 years, all of those devices, all of those objects that are constructing our infrastructures are basically different kinds of rocks. That then in, 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 in the time of like 30, 40 years were somehow trans transfer into the infrastructure. And then I said, okay, let's maybe then this map have basically this another dimension. So basically from this one line, I went into some bigger space and started the story uh, with Earth. And with something that we can call deep time, so the process of like geological process of, of formation of those elements. And the first thing I came with is basically periodic system of elements. No? So what is the story here? Then I tried to understand which elements, you know, what was going on there. And the interesting story is that in one device, like Amazon Echo or like iPhone or whatever, there is like three-fourths of periodic system of elements. So before, in our like hundred years ago, we were just using, we were not using so many elements. And most of the devices were built out of few elements. Now you have all elements packed into one little small uh, device. And then I didn't know how to, to make a story out of that. Because it, it, I understood it's like really, really complex. Because if you follow each of those elements, it will tell you a different story. Maybe they're not so different at the end, but it's a different story starting in different countries. Some of them, most of them start in Congo. Some of them start in China. Some of them start in, in South America. And then you have a different stories that are, that are like uh, really complex. So I used, I found like really useful for me, really useful graphical elements because then I understood, okay, I need to deal with this complexity 
and need to reduce this complexity so I could put it in one drawing, you know, even if it's complex and big, it cannot be big as whole world, no? So this is, and this is this position of the cartographer, it's always position of the one who is curating complexity. So this is this bias of cartographer, you know, who is basically telling you a picture, it looks like a map, it looks like a representation of reality, but basically it's a storytelling. Because in order to make this story, I needed to make, I needed to cut 99.9% .9 of information and to, to stay somewhere, basically to create some kind of visi visual representation of one story. And for that, I used the triangles. So what are those triangles? I stole those triangles from Christian Fuchs, but he also took it from Marx. And this is this triangle that is saying like, resources with the use of tools and end labor are transformed into the product. And then this product is becoming a resource that is again with the use of labor transformed into the product and so on, so on, so on. So it's like hundreds and hundreds of different tri triangles that are like shaping this story. Uh, each of those triangles uh, represent one type of activity. So we are starting in mines, then we are going to like smelters and refiners, then we are going to component manufacturers and so on, so on. So this is a really simplified version of, of, of reality. But what I try to do, I try to list all the, the issues that are related for each of those cycles. So like, for example, with mines, we are speaking about hard labor, forced labor, child labor, low paid labor, conflict minerals, environmental and working hazards. Then hazards, health risk hazards for people, but also what was like really interesting, uh, environmental hazards. No? So what we are doing to, to, to nature. No? And, and, so, and it went, so if we think about those networks and if we think about those devices in this sense of time and the process of creation, then we are not speaking anymore about privacy. We are not speaking anymore about data exploitation. We are not speaking anymore about all of these, you know, terms that I was completely obsessed with. Here, the main topic is basically exploitation of nature and exploitation of human labor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I will not go into details of mining because I believe that it will happen like after. But I, what I also try to do in this picture is to try to understand how much people are earning by doing, by being part of those triangles. So it's starting with the zero and un unpaid user labor, but also like starting with the $1 Per, per, uh, per day in some mines in Congo and going to e-waste and landfill workers in India. So we are there somewhere around one to three dollars per day. No? But the person on the top of this pyramid is earning seven million per day. So this is the scale of inequality between the, the low and lowest point of this map to the highest point is one to seven million. From my point of view, this is not so maybe fair distribution of income that we are seeing, if we are seeing all the process as a, as a, as a whole. No? But another interesting thing with, that I was facing is basically this. And this is how I really in the beginning wanted to make this map. I wanted to try to map this process as, as, as a fractal. Because what I saw is like more you are zooming in, more you are seeing new triangles of labor, relation between labor, uh, resources and, and the product. But it was too crazy and too complicated and maybe not, in my sense, not so perfect in some points. I was not able to do it so well. So I, I skip into something else. But, but th th this is, from my point of view, really good representation of the complexity that we are facing. Another thing that I, 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 I notice is basically, it is that like the production process is a black box by itself. It's not just the algorithmic labor, algorithms and so on. It, the, the, the production of, of those devices, it's a new form of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a black box. And, and for example, there is a really great story how Intel needed two years in order to find out is there any uh, 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 those kind of conflict materials from Congo in their uh, 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 chips or not, no? two years on their own supply chain. Because what, what's going on? So you, for example, have uh, uh, Shenzhen and Fo Foxconn where all of those like components are arriving. So for example, in one iPhone, you have like 
270-something, the first level suppliers. And, if, and I, what I did then, I tried to calculate, to find where are those suppliers based, and try to calculate this, just this last jump to, to Shenzhen, and it's like uh, two times to the moon and back amount of kilometers, just in the last step. But then before that, you have 270 suppliers that have their own 270 suppliers, that have their own 270 suppliers, that have their own 270 suppliers. No? So it's kind of like really hard to, to, to investigate and to, to, to really understand how this complexity uh, uh, works. But it's also interesting, it's how those, like in the beginning, it, if we start you know, from mines, and, and, and this is like hard labor, and then more you are going up, climbing up in those triangles, you are, are, we are seeing different kinds of in, uh, combination between like human uh, uh, labor and, and algorithmic labor, data, everything combined into one. So one of the most interesting places I visited was the, the, the Amazon uh, fulfillment center. So this is a completely crazy place. It's, com it's huge. It looks, and it also when you're approaching from, from Far, you don't see it because it's painted in the same color as sky. You know, it's a cloud. <laughs> so when you enter there, you see a lot, lot of, you know, robots, and basically those shelves are moving around the place. And but what was really interesting, what is going on on those shelves? Those are objects. So by some kind of human logic, it will be books, 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 books. A, B, C, D. This color, that color. This is human logic. But but things on those shelves are not. They're according to any human logic. They're there according. They are some kind of reflection of the real-time data of what is sold with what. So it's a reflection of the big data, let's say. And then position of the human worker there. It's complete. This this person is completely lost in a sense that no one will be able to find any object there, human being. No. So this is why they have a different devices that are helping them to raise the hand or do this or whatever they do as a reaction to this kind of reflection of data and so ever. You know? Really, really crazy. But what was also interesting for me and, and one of the way that I took from, from Facebook investigation was that I really like to investigate patents. So one of the patents I found is that, that so this is how those shelves and robots looks like. No? So I found a patent where they want to put the human worker within a cage. And then, basically, the cage is moved by the robot that is basically dancing this according to this big data and everything. So it completely, and, and then for me, I, this is why we put it in the essay, this story about the cage, because this is the perfect, uh, uh, mm, uh, for me, metaphor for, for uh, this alienation of, of worker, of labor, in which you don't know why you are there, you are in a cage and like... But then this story was, was in a way, took by the, the lot of mainstream media as some kind of like, you know, spectacle or whatever, and then Amazon said, no, we are abandoned this idea of cage and stuff like this. But anyway, that was about cage, but... Uh, so, basically this map have a three parts. I explain a bit bird, and then the middle of the map it's life, and then the right part of the map it's death, that I never have a time to, to explain. <laughs> but what is also like for me, what was like really interesting, it's this down part of the map. So we try, so this map is basically dissecting all of these kind of invisible forms of labor. So, labeling and so on. But the, this is the part that I really had like, you know, weeks of weeks of some kind of like craziness of, of doing this. It's basically what's going on under, you know. So, so here what we are speaking, we are speaking of, about process of training of, of, of those machine learning systems. And of course there is like labeling, there is like a lot of different kinds of like invisible labor uh, processes, but down under everything it's, it's basically data, you know, because what are those uh, machine learning systems are just systems for, for, for um, let's say, compression of huge amount of data. So you take like billions of pictures and then you compress this into some kind of n-dimensional uh, uh, 
statistical space, nothing else, it's a statistics. No? But on the bottom is basically those billions and billions and thousands and thousands of pictures. You know? But then what we are thinking, okay, from where those pictures are coming from, or those voices or whatever they are training on, they are coming from the process of quantification of nature. And this is what we are all so obsessed about in, in science and everything, it's to quantify something. If we are able to quantify, then it's great. If we are not, then it's not so good. But quantification of nature, it's a base for all of, all of this. And in most of the time, what we are speak, speaking, we are speaking about quantification of, of our bodies, our social body, our uh, quantification of uh, biometrics, our quantification of our psychological or behavioral, medical, forensic, profiling. Then we have a state apparatus that is also doing different types of quantification of us. Then we have uh, our social bodies, then we have uh, economic and financial uh, interactions and so on and so on. This is quantification of human body actions and behavior. On the other side, we are trying to quantify all human-made products, whatever we do. We write a story or we make a building or we whatever. So all of this is, is, is part of this process of quantification. So what, the, 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 what is the, the, the golden, you know, this is the golden rush of today. It's basically how to put your flag on some of those fields. Is it like our body? Is it like our diseases, is it our like how tall we are, how our face look like, or how whatever look like. This is the gold rush. How to quantify and how to basically enclose some of those fields. In the moment they are able to enclose, to quantify, they are able to commodify. So from enclosure, it's going to commodification. Transforming something that is like our body or our social react, uh, interaction into the profit. So when we are speaking about Google, for example, the moment when they are acquiring all the data sets of like uh, cancer ill patients from like UK in form of scans or whatever, we are basically spe speaking of Google being able to enclose one field. Because in the moment they enclose that field, they are able then to create some kind of system of automatic recognition, whatever, that will become their next product. So this is the, the main uh, uh, rush in this industry that exists uh, uh, today. So I will now just use my last five minutes of this presentation to speak about how those maps are basically uh, not possible and basically one big fantasy, you know? So, even this is the, probably the most complex map of this process within Facebook and stuff like this. This is one big part of this is one big imagination. Because like to do this kind of stuff, it's like to go through the woods during the night with a torch. So you see something, you don't see a lot, you are then making some kind of drawing, but basically you are not able to see a big picture. So what I was trying to do, I was trying to do the same, so to go through those spaces and to get some information and to try to, to map all of this together. But in a way, like the map that, that is made here probably never existed, okay, the, the reality, this reality never existed like this completely like this, because like, for example, different patents belongs to different years, or my interpretation of something, it's like, was maybe not accurate, and so on, so on. But it speaks a lot about our capacity to understand how those systems that are basically the most wealthy companies in the world, the most influential in our social life or whatever, the one that defining how we interact, so we are not able to do it by no any means, not just like some person trying to understand what's going on, but also on the level of the government, also on the, any other level, it's just not possible to make an accurate map of the process. So, and they're trying their best not to let us uh, uh, do the same. And then there is like this kind of other problem, it's like how 
Because when we are dealing with complexity, in order to tell this story, I need to reduce this information to something that is readable, human readable, no? And in a sense, even it doesn't look like those maps are the biggest as they can be. So for example, what I'm operating on, I'm operating on the size of the biggest possible size in Adobe Illustrator and exists how big the file can be. And I cannot zoom more in than here because then it starts to, to make some kind of glitches and stuff like this. So there are limits of the file that I'm facing. Another limit is like you cannot make a bigger map because then people will not be able to see when they are seeing like physically. So there are a lot of limitations, but each of those limitations is basically defining like what storytelling is. You know, like my storytelling. This is my own bias, you know. But in the same tech, uh, sense, this, my bias in creating this map, it's also the bias that we can see in artificial intelligence and we can see in algorithms. It's basically compressing something really complex into something. And then, yeah. So, I think that's maybe enough for this day. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, welcome. Um, since we both wear uh, several hats, um, sometimes individually, sometimes at the same time, uh, sometimes under the same hat together, uh, we decided to do the presentation uh, together. Uh, so we're gonna flip um, a little bit uh, while we uh, present. Uh, we are both um, artists uh, already for quite a while. So in order to get into the, the modus operandi of both our practices, we're going to show three works that we made prior to this collaborative project. Um, and then uh, Jean is going to talk about the Tesla crash speculation, which is the project he did for the Fellowship of Digital Earth, um, of which I had the privilege to be there at the beginning and at the end. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about On Trade Off, which is the overarching project that does research on the influence of extraction, uh, transportation, and transformation of lithium, of which uh, many more artists and writers and researchers uh, are a part. So it's going to be in different sections that we will move through the slides. Okay, um, from right to left. Uh, this is a low tech, uh, but to explain some complex uh, transformation of society. Uh, this uh, bulb lamp is an uh, Afro lamp. It's some, some kind of series, uh, series of lamp. I'm doing that, I don't know until when. <laughs> Uh, maybe yeah, I, I, I did. I'm, I'm doing a, another. Uh, it means uh, that we are missing simply. We are missing sufficient energy, uh, like water and electricity, in Congo uh, and in Africa in general. But you know, uh, the evolution of world. Uh, uh, come from, uh, I can say, mechanic, uh, cybernetic, uh, electricity, electronic, and today uh, is uh, some kind of spread of data, uh, uh, internet. Uh, but it's too sad and struggle for us uh, to maintain correctly uh, the electricity. And the sad expression uh, from uh, Congo is the best place uh, to hide money uh, is the book. <laughs> uh, the book on the table uh, uh, in the living room uh, because anyone uh, can open uh, uh, to read. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not doing the exception. Uh, it's too struggle for me to, to read too, but I'm writing a, a lot of. Uh, because of 
the energy I have to check water uh, later and electricity is to struggle and I decide to explain that uh, by drawing of uh, af uh, afro lamp I, I call it uh, afro lamp uh, is seri you can have the chance to browse somewhere and to find it the second in the middle uh, that too strange maybe uh, one day uh, I discovered that uh, my line, the equator, uh, is too big, like radius. And for you and the rest, Europe and hemisphere, is too small. Uh, yeah. I, I was trying to explain uh, the issues in Africa, like electricity and everything. And this day, I, I, I discovered that uh, maybe from my ancestor, uh, our rotation is too, uh, too big, huh? maybe. <laughs> you will check after. It's too big for one day, uh, one night. Uh, maybe the rotation is, is too big. And maybe from my ancestor, we have to be uh, sufficiently tired. Huh? and maybe we, we are missing the energy to do electricity uh, now. And that's why I made it in cardboard. Uh, it's some kind of machine. And I added a third movement and to give the chance to Africa uh, to, to be uh, at hemisphere. Too. Yeah, it's doing uh, like kind of random uh, movement in space. It's working. In reality, you can check uh, the name is rotation. Yeah, you will find uh, we have not video, but is 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 working. Yeah, from four years, but cardboard is strong too. Uh, it's working until now. And this one too strange also. Uh, yeah, that the issue from the paranoia of immateriality and immateriality. One day I was browsing like that in, uh, on Facebook. Yeah, because if you, you check my Facebook, uh, there is a lot of line of people who uh, is waiting my confirmation. I don't like, and to avoid the, yeah, you know, the mushrooming because you, you can have a lot of people for you. And if I confirm for one, uh, yeah, I can have yeah, some kind of uh, 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 mushrooming contact. And one day I was doing like that. By accident, uh, I, I confirmed some, some person. And the second after, it was like a pressure. Uh, it was someone who is curator for Facebook uh, uh, commission. And from that, one week after, or maybe Two weeks, I, I was somewhere in uh, Belgium office, uh, a Facebook office, and to do uh, di di this work, yeah, maybe it's too complicated. <laughs> and maybe I can't explain more than that, yeah. Maybe. Okay, uh, you can explain more. Uh, I'm going the other way around, so I didn't realize uh, we had the opposite uh, direction, so I'll go from uh, left to right. So on the left you see um, a satellite dish that is made uh, entirely out of um, computer circuit boards. Um, and I would say my, my, my work in, in general, as you heard in the introduction, uh, is trying to imagine uh, how we will look back to the past and the future and uh, how we imagine uh, how we imagined the, the future in the past. And it it, it's something that um, that always uh, fascinated me as a, as a speculative moment uh, in time where someone or something will find remains of our current uh, civilization and um, will have to make sense out of it and will try to create or and write uh, our history and 
as, as, a, as a consequence of constant uh, evolution, and we bump into that the whole time as well, when we try to write our own history, the ones uh, from our parents and grandfathers, <laughs> is that uh, we are always lacking information and we constantly need to rewrite it. So depending on new fi finds somewhere, uh, we even need to change our own age as a species and how we migrate it and so on. So, uh, yeah, I would say it's, it's safe to assume that we will also miss information uh, in the far future and that things will not always um, yeah, work out well in the way that it's being represented. A way to tackle that is to already preserve things uh, right now for future generations uh, to, to discover. Um, it's a, a kind of a form of future archaeology which is being um, yeah, used by not only artists but also uh, scientists, um, cosmologists. Uh, think of the, the, the Golden Voyager discs that are floating around in space, time capsules that are being buried. Uh, and yeah, they always try to encapsulate um, the, the highlights of, of human society. Whether you agree with that or not, whether it's representative for all cultures and so on, it's another, uh, it's another story, of course. And uh, this, this work specifically deals with all the um, uh, human remains that fly around uh, Earth or that are uh, left over on um, uh, planets and, and on the moon. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a new kind of field of archaeology uh, that does exist and that is called uh, um, uh, space archaeology. And they use it both to look at ancient uh, sites on uh, planet Earth, but also to look at remnants of the space age. And uh, one, one beautiful example I found was that they decided to not go again to the first moon landing site because they know, they know that we will just trample all over it and our techniques are not good enough to make an analysis of that uh, uh, iconic event. So they decided to just close it off for future archaeologists to do the job uh, for us. So here you see an attempt, a clumsy attempt to uh, collect all computer bits and pieces without actually knowing how it works to create a satellite to make a connection with all these uh, uh, trash and abandoned satellites that are uh, flying around uh, on Earth. Uh, the second one is called uh, a techno fossil, and that comes uh, that is borrowed from Jan, Jan Zalasiewicz, who um, is the, the head of the Anthropocene Research uh, Group, and he coined the term uh, not only techno fossil but also technosphere. So it's, it's basically looking at the contents of the geological layer that we are currently being uh, yeah, uh, constructing and that will uh, for sure also contain um, telephones and computers as, uh, as, as future fossils. But uh, what was important for me about, about this work is that I went back to the source of um, the, the most used metal in a telephone, which is copper. Uh, so I went to um, the, the copper belt in Congo to a copper mine to get uh, a piece of rock where you see uh, traces of malachite. So the green is, is malachite out of which the, the copper is being extracted. And uh, with this work I wanted to um, bridge the, the lack of knowledge which exists both at the source and at the, the end uh, product. It's a little bit better now. People are more aware of what is in their telephone. Um, this was made five years ago. Uh, also for the Lubumbashi Biennale uh, to show where the origin is of these materials that are uh, in your phone. Because what, what, what struck me is that the, the, the miners and then specifically the, the, the creuseurs, so the ones that are with their hands digging in the ground, they don't know what comes out of this malachite and uh, if they do know the sum that, that it's used to make copper, they don't know that it ends up in their telephone, uh, which most of them actually do have. Um, at, the other, at the other hand, uh, the end consumer, he doesn't know what is in his telephone. When he does know, he doesn't know where it comes from or under which conditions it's being taken out of the ground before it's being transformed. So this was for me a way to connect the beginning and the end of, of, a, of a production process, but also transport it towards the future as a kind of fossil that uh, can represent 
uh, our yeah, technology and society. The last one is called uh, Future Flora, and then with the, the double dot uh, Manono, and it's a link to the, um, the, the project that we will talk about uh, afterwards. Um, it's kind of complex because it tells a story about different materials, but I'm, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, uh, the lithium and the copper. So what you see as a, as a, as a ground uh, um, carrier or the, the, the board is a, a printed circuit board, the basis of uh, every computer, um, which makes use of a, of a, a, a copper circuit um, and to connect the different electronic uh, components. Um, but instead of an um, electronic circuit, I uh, transformed the, the concession map of uh, Manono. And Manono is the place where um, recently they discovered the largest lithium reserve uh, in the world in the form of uh, ore. And that is um, being um, found in Spodumen, so the, 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 the little island dots that you see are the islands of Spodumene that are in uh, the concession. So the lines are the concession that are owned by uh, an Australian mining company together with the Chinese and, and a little bit of the, the Congolese uh, state. Um, and it's still in the, the, the form of uh, speculation. So there is no mining uh, for lithium in Congo yet. Uh, it might never happen, but the fact that it is being uh, owned and claimed and discovered is already enough to influence uh, yeah, market, uh, markets like the London uh, Metal Exchange, uh, where yeah, most of the, the money is being made. It's not necessarily in the material itself, but in the speculation on it. Um, so, but what you see is, is um, a, a contemporary version of a Lucasa, and Lucasa is a memory board uh, that was used by the um, uh, Cuba, uh, also in Congo, and it looks very much like um, uh, a circuit board in a computer, but instead of uh, electronic components, they used seeds and, and uh, beads and uh, stones, but it contains, I would argue, as much information as a contemporary computer. And uh, we talked about it before of ways of how you can contain uh, a lot of information that is not uh, so fragile as, as, uh, as it is today in the form of digital information. Uh, I think at that time, at that time they found a, a brilliant way uh, to do that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite small. Uh, it's it's um, a memory board that uh, you read by, by touching it and it works very much like uh, a contemporary memory palace or a mental memory palace which has different routes, different uh, rooms that all tap into a different chapter of knowledge and they would include everything from uh, ancestral history to uh, religion to uh, ownership, uh, migration routes, um, animals, um, hunting uh, methods to uh, what to do in case of droughts, and they would add more and more information on it coming from previous generations. There was only one person um, who could read it. He was like the, the keeper of, of, uh, of the knowledge, and he would train others to um, be able to represent certain chapters of the knowledge, and then they would train one person to take his role uh, over. And that was for yeah, hundreds of years. It was being passed on and added uh, like that. Uh, and then to make a link to the contemporary uh, use of um, possibly uh, the best way to preserve information, it's, it's how uh, people try to imagine how in the far future we can warn people uh, that there is nuclear waste buried somewhere. Um, it's a big challenge to think in time frames of 10 or 100,000 years. Uh, and I think one of the best solutions that they found so far to warn people in or other, other uh, organisms in the far future is by creating rituals that are being passed on to the next generation. So definitely not writing. For most of human history, there was no writing. Definitely not any kind of language because that changes too fast and too rapidly. So the, the, the initiation of a ritual that is being performed continuously is probably the best way uh, to preserve that. So that, that makes a link between uh, yeah, these different uh, things. Okay, uh, my uh, research proposal for uh, digital is uh, fellowship 
or uh, confronting uh, terms such as uh, uh, Occident in, in French, Occident, uh, speculation, uh, gray, uh, green speculation, uh, and it's also to, uh, the autobiography. Uh, the autobiography to to remain uh, what uh, we were doing uh, as uh, wire uh, cars atelier uh, as uh, children, and uh, this is uh, uh, Daddy Chikaya, uh, our friend and artist, uh, who is doing the crash uh, model in uh, in Copa before uh, to start uh, the bigger uh, the bigger model and yeah uh, this is the official uh, presentation uh, in congo uh, 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 also, uh, uh, also during the uh, contour uh, contour bayenio and mechelen uh, and in Paris too, maybe, uh, uh, because the crash model met some uh, around uh, in Lubumbashi, Syria, and uh, in Europe, uh, Europe too. Ah, okay, uh, this is uh, the uh, atelier, fantastic atelier, uh, uh, for the uh, biggest, uh, biggest one. Uh, which will uh, uh, discover uh, the uh, uh, Tesla coil uh, video uh, uh, just in the end of uh, this speech. Uh, and I can explain uh, just a bit uh, about the beginning. Uh, it's too strange. I used uh, the linear function. Uh, it's uh, is sim simple function, the li linear on two dimension, and <laughs> from that I tried to understand uh, the form of uh, uh, the Tesla, uh, and from that with uh, some Alpine friends, artists, uh, visitors, and we tried to convert uh, two dimension in uh, three dimension, uh, uh, and we would like to respect uh, the, the really, the scale one uh, of Tesla. Uh, maybe uh, we are not far uh, uh, from uh, Tesla. Uh, it was a bit struggle to understand the form and the functionality uh, of, of form in space for Tesla, but now maybe uh, it's done. And right, uh, you can uh, discover the last version because it's, it's, it's moving. Uh, for Bayenio, uh, we come to remove uh, the base, uh, which is the uh, uh, real car, and to replace it by uh, 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 wire and, uh, and, and steel, and to make exactly the model uh, uh, when uh, we were we were child. Uh, maybe is a bit correct now. Yeah, this is uh, Manono expedition. Uh, everybody likes so much. Uh, uh, the, the pictures uh, uh, because uh, we got the collaboration uh, with some people uh, uh, directly in Manono City uh, for photo and for some visit for some information and um, yeah we kept uh, now the relationship uh, with the people uh, uh, these people uh, uh, from Manono uh, for something, for some uh, uh, development, for ed ed education, for some helping too, as an artist uh, or t technician. Uh, maybe in future uh, uh, we have some plan uh, to make a really uh, uh, collaboration. In the middle you can see uh, the lithium uh, and with Martin we got s s uh, a joke in M Manono uh, because we were very fast to discover uh, 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 the lithium, and um, one day uh, we just uh, uh, pick uh, uh, some stone, and for us tonight, ah, yeah, it's done. We have the lithium uh, because the aspect was uh, like a metal, uh, metal aspect. But tomorrow, when the specialists come and uh, uh, try to uh, give us. 
uh, the really idea uh, of, um, of lithium. And uh, this is one of model uh, um, uh, of lithium, the spodumen. And there are existing uh, a lot of types of, uh, of lithium. Maybe uh, Martin is a, a big specialist to explain you uh, which kind of types uh, we can find uh, of lithium. Not me, uh, uh, I'm uh, just uh, yeah, uh, some kind of craft and artist. Yeah, uh, this is the rest uh, of uh, metal uh, components of uh, the bigger factory uh, from America mostly, uh, and you can find the big uh, area uh, of this one uh, on Manono uh, City. Uh, but the first idea uh, for us is in future uh, to, to, to put directly the museum uh, uh, on. Yeah, uh, because it's too impressive to, to find uh, a very, very uh, big metal, uh, very, very big components uh, of factory and abandoned like, uh, like that in the city and is like uh, the path of life of citizen from, uh, uh, from Manono is, uh, is too strange. And uh, this is the carrot, I don't know the name in, uh, in English, uh, after uh, the, the, the drilling. And uh, maybe Martin will uh, speak a lot uh, about. Uh, it's important to confirm uh, uh, the positive uh, uh, result uh, after drilling, before the capital uh, uh, come to make investment and to begin the, the factory. And it was very, very uh, uh, bigger uh, uh, investigation and drilling, and we discovered the rest uh, of, uh, of investigation, of, of research, and maybe I, I, I can't say a, a lot, but from the te theoretically, yeah, it's positive, uh, maybe, uh, the investigation can come uh, to start uh, uh, the uh, exploitation. But the accident and the speculation, yeah, I, I have to finish uh, by the speculation is uh, now is a scandal because uh, there are missing uh, the, the roads uh, to make expedition of, of mine cross, you know. Uh, uh, because it's too sad before the Congo uh, could provide uh, cobalt, uh, copper, and, and, and the rest. But now is the time for lithium. Where is the route to, to make expedition? That is this, the accident, the scandal uh, in um, our proposal, uh, proposal research. And together we have to pay, uh, uh, um, to pay attention and to, to make better. Uh, because after lithium, uh, we will discover maybe oil. Uh, I, I don't know. Because we are, we are advising to, to, to jump to the tourism and uh, green period. What is the route? What is the right? Nothing. Nothing. That's a very, very big scandal. Uh, um, maybe we have together to pay uh, attention. I can't point uh, each one, but uh, we have to pay attention. Yeah, maybe. Okay. <coughs> yeah, the texts are jumping. I don't know why this doesn't look like it was put on paper. Anyway. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 the crash also in the title, just to come come uh, briefly back to that is about this this crash of, of two different realities Tesla uh, is not present uh, in Congo um, when the, the project started people had never heard of Tesla but already Tesla is using ingredients uh, from from Congo and the, the lithium is mainly known for as the main ingredient uh, for the batteries for electric cars but they are also in our computers and telephones the other ingredient is cobalt, uh, of which 60% is being found in Congo, and that is already being mined and written about internationally. People know that there is child labor and so on and so on. Um, for lithium, lithium is being put forward as um, the main ingredient that will um, 
yeah, help make the green revolution possible. But uh, as as soon as we started this research project, we we put the green revolution between brackets uh, because the, um, the 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 price uh, we we will have uh, to pay for it for this green revolution or change from fossil fuel uh, to uh, electric uh, energy. Um, might might be equally high, uh, not only environmentally but also on a, on a social level. And um, but what is also striking in in in, um, in the work is that there is no battery. Uh, that that's what comes back to this uh, this dream of uh, children making their ideal car model. Is that they hope to have one day to have that car um, and. That's why this enlargement to, to have a scale one-on-one -on -one, uh, copy of the Tesla, it, it, it still stays a dream because although uh, they might one day have a car, it will not, uh, not be a Tesla. So th although Congo is supplying the, the main raw materials to make it happen, they don't receive uh, the, the end product. And it's, it's like a recurring thing that uh, people don't take in account when they, when they buy a Tesla or, or they uh, are going for uh, green energy, is that a lot of the, the social constructions that are being put in place already a long time ago, they are just being continued with a different uh, material. So in the end, there is very little, uh, little change there. And that's uh, also what uh, brings me to the title of On Trade Off, which is uh, the overarching title of a long research project in which about 14 people are now involved, each looking at a different section of a, this very complex um, yeah, story about the, the extraction and transformation of, uh, of lithium uh, because it, it, it is being, it, it could be being mined in the future um, uh, coming from Congo as it is uh, having the, the world's largest lithium reserve in the form of ore um, by an Australian mining company. So we want to follow it also to Australia. But the mining company is actually a shell company that is um, yeah, mainly working together with China. So then uh, we follow it to China, where currently 90% of the electric lithium batteries are being produced. And uh, all the, the different artists and uh, researchers are focusing on a different section of the project, either looking more at ec ecological complications, social issues, or uh, choosing one specific geographic area to focus on. And all these works uh, together, um, after a few years, will hopefully shed a larger light on, on the entire um, yeah, process of the extraction and, and transformation of a raw material. And that's where uh, the, the on trade off uh, comes in. It's not just a, a game of words with on off and, and dealing with electricity, but it's also about the, the trade off. You know, you, you might ch uh, solve one problem and then we come back to uh, solving a problem with a problem um, by, by creating a, another one. Um, because also in the, in the recycling process, it, it's, I would almost say, a human tradition to first make uh, an invention and transform a material and then afterwards, afterwards look at the the, the, the consequences of it. Um, nobody knows what to do with all the, eh, all the batteries, how they are being recycled, if they can be recycled at all. Um, and where will they end up? A lot of electronic waste is being shipped back uh, to Africa where they receive again the materials that come uh, from there. Um, but in order to do what? There is just no total vision uh, of how to work with a material and, and have this uh, cradle to cradle uh, construction being built into it. So uh, one uh, thing that um, another artist participant uh, in the project on trade off did, um, I don't know, first I'm going to this one. So in order to get an understanding of um, not only the material, but also what mining is and um, um, how these mining companies operate, uh, we also did research on the Bel Belgian mining history, uh, which is very much related to the Congolese mining history, as uh, it was first done in, in Wallonie with uh, coal mining in, in 1600s. They moved to uh, Limburg, uh, it, an area which also covers the Netherlands and part of Germany, uh, bits in France. 
um, where the same uh, banks that finance it and the same companies that build the infrastructure of mines later moved uh, to Congo and used the exact same kind of not only methodologies, but also a way of treating people, uh, how they build uh, houses uh, for uh, the workers, uh, and so on and so on. And Belgium is already now in, in the, the museological kind of commemoration uh, period uh, where you can visit as a tourist the, the Belgian uh, mining history. Um, the question is whether uh, that also will happen uh, in Congo and that's why we put in the slides before uh, which were remnants of the, the Belgian tin mining uh, industry that was happening in Manolo uh, at the time of the Belgian colonization. It is still being used uh, but not, uh, not in, a, in, a, in, a, in a factory way but more manually so people still extract uh, cassiterite but also tantalum of which uh, coltan is coming another uh, main uh, ingredient uh, for telephones or crucial ingredient for telephones and, and, and laptops. And of this one specifically, Congo has 90% of the reserves, so very, very important uh, material. One of the conflict minerals uh, that you uh, probably have heard of. So, um, and then another reason to use the Tesla, because Tesla is an I iconic um, example. Uh, which will uh, hopefully force other companies uh, to, to, to make a change, but on itself it, it's, it's more like a, a promotional a stunt company uh, uh, that, that sh shot the first car into space, which is still flying around with all the other uh, human remains and garbage uh, in space. Um, and ironically, uh, the first Tesla that uh, Jean went into was when we landed in Dubai. We were being picked up at the airport by a taxi. That was a Tesla. Uh, yeah, which good, good omen. And for the Lubumbashi Biennale, which uh, uh, opened uh, two weeks ago, another artist, participant of On Trade of Marilyn Dijkman, uh, brought uh, uh, a self-made Tesla coil uh, to Congo. Uh, we were lucky enough to find uh, a young uh, genius that um, was able to build a Tesla coil because it's, it's quite uh, complicated to build, more complicated than the, the both of us can, can figure out. Um, it generates between three and a half and three, uh, one and a half and uh, three million volts. Uh, you can find manuals online, most people take three times, uh, he just did it in, in, in one go. And it, it, it's charging the car, so that it, was, it was a performance for the opening of the, of the Biennale. Charging the car, but since there is no battery, uh, you can shoot as much energy at it as you want. It, it's just going to fry the car and, and, and that's it, it will, not, it will not drive. And then we made a, fo a small film. But it needs sound though. Is there sound? There is no sound. Why is there no sound? <laughs> ah, okay. She just if I... Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, it's extremely loud. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can tell you. And uh, it's like an, an, an artificial lightning uh, creator. Uh, yeah, this is filmed at uh, four meters. It's being directed straight to the car, so it's... I don't know if you see it uh, or whether it's not dark enough. Um, but it's mortal. Uh, when you get too close, uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. So I'm going to start off just uh, by uh, I uh, tried to kind of think about some of the similarities between the two presentations to bring them into conversation with each other. I have a few questions and then hopefully we'll have a lot of chance for you to ask questions and engage with the material. Um, so just as um, kind of thinking about connections between the work, uh, both works were thinking about new black gold. This, these were actually terms that both of them used in some writing. Um, one, in one case it's lithium and in another case definitely data along with other resource materials. Um, 
both have been trying to make visible, invisible systems uh, that enable the production, distribution, fine tuning, and discharge of electronic devices, networks, things uh, emphasizing the materiality of things we often take for granted as immaterial. Um, and then uh, in the case of Jean and Martin's work, um, what they, uh, I mean, bes besides challenging the, materia the immateriality um, or our perceptions of immateriality of some of these technologies, they're also challenging some of the assumptions we have about um, the sustainability of quote unquote green technologies, which I think is quite interesting. Um, in both cases, they're following like one element, lithium or one system whether that's Facebook profiles or AI or um, Echo Dots, and kind of using, following the path of that one object or element in order to um, understand how it's embedded within larger networks of capital, economic disparities, ecological disasters, and inhumane working conditions. Um, and, and what's really nice about this is both of them then are able to figure something which is a planetary system without losing sight of some of the localized inequalities. Um, and, um, and I think just to bring back uh, something that was made in a conversation yesterday, which was it was about machines versus humans, I think what they make really clear is that it's not necessarily machines versus humans, more like capital versus labor, um, capital versus the economy. So I think it's complicating that narrative. Um, and both kind of are bridging distances or compressing distances to kind of bring together origin and source, you know, follow something from life to death. So there's kind of a mapping of things that are often remote and not seen together in order for us to understand things in totality. So just um, to start off like that. And then, so I wanted to, since the kind of day is focused on cartography and mapping, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about mapping to start off with. And one, um, I wanted to ask Jean and Martin if you could talk about how mapping, whether that's, you know, like you're, the way that you kind of follow things or relations, how mapping figures into your practice or how you think about what you're doing as a form of mapping. Um, and then I wanted to ask you, since you talked about um, curating or like cartography as a form of curating, um, what some of the limits that you encounter, like what exact, how limiting, particular ways in which it, um, mapping was limiting. <coughs> so kind of thinking about what can mapping do and what can it not do for us? So if you wanted to start, I don't know who would like to start. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think mapping is something really, really important um, because it shows uh, how manipulation works. And I would argue it starts um, with the first image, uh, Earthrise uh, from Apollo 8, where you see the Earth for the first time, but uh, it became the most dis distributed image in uh, human history, but it's not the real image. And that's where the manipulation starts. So the original slide, the photo that they took, it, it has Earth in the, in the left upper corner. And it's w what they would argue upside down. But of course, if you're a little bit aware of, of spatial functionalities, uh, there is no up and down on, on planet Earth. And for me, that's a brilliant example of how our perception of the world is being uh, manipulated for whatever reason without us knowing it and then it goes into the, um, the, the map making uh, when you represent earth and, and turn it into a flat surface uh, a consequence of that is that the continents are being deformed and well I, I was always almost going to say ironically but it's it's more sadly uh, the consequence of that is that mainly around the equator the, the continents are being sh shrunk because uh, they're, they're, they're much bigger. So, so historically, our perception of Africa was that it was a, quite a, a small continent, whereas it's actually much, much bigger uh, than, than, than we know uh, and that we are aware of. And then also the, the, the order in which uh, countries are being represented, either being on top or below, south, north, all these kind of concepts that we have of how the world is being uh, understood and, and categorized, it's coming out of uh, cartography and, and out of uh, uh, manipulation, I, I, I would argue. Uh, whereas the, the reverse, and that's why it's so important in my work, um, 
I, I try to follow r any raw material and see uh, what kind of trajectory it followed. Uh, it, most of them, uh, as, as, as you said, touch upon Congo at some point as either an origin or uh, that they played a major role in the, even in the transformation of, of the material. Uh, but it is, it is being al almost uh, cautiously written out of history. Um, it, it's, it's not entering in, into the, the educational curriculum uh, what role Congo played and is playing in uh, most of the material inventions uh, and, and, and objects that we use in, in, in daily life. And for me, that is that. Yeah, I, I found that uh, very, uh, very shocking. And, and um, I think that is something that uh, it's our responsibility to rewrite history and, and give more uh, credit to uh, places, not necessarily people, but places where raw materials come from. Yeah, I can j jump uh, just a bit uh, from my artwork. That's why I'm using to um, um, mapping, figurative and really uh, mapping. Because the manipulation for me uh, starts uh, from colonization. I learn only European American uh, geography and story from col the colonization. That's why uh, the map is a super nice uh, discovering for me. Uh, if I saw the map, I said, wow, <laughs> I have to do and to discover it. It's no problem to learn America, but for the colonization, uh, yeah, uh, maybe gold, uh, it was a bit uh, yeah, bad. But no problem. But now I like to discover no mapping, yeah, any mapping. Yeah. So, so kind of, I guess, if I can think about it. So it's the way I see it, and from what you said as well, is it seems like it's a recentering of certain things that have been figured on the margins, right? So in your work through tracing some of these relations, it's kind of thinking about the centrality of the role of Congo when it's been written, maybe in the margins of development. Yeah. Also, as an, an attraction for. Um, the it's 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 quite close to, to Congo. It's it's more in the, the Central African Republic where you have um, a, a magnetic uh, like dark hole, which probably is the reason why so many of these uh, heavy metals find themselves so concentrated within that region. Mm. So even even uh, if you follow that kind of uh, logic, uh, for me Congo is more uh, in the center of the world. Uh, in, in, compared to any, any other place. Interesting. So, so you engage with mapping as a method, and then maybe if you could talk about what it lets you do and what it, what it well, makes difficult. What I really like is this idea of, of counter mapping. So basically what you said, like most of the times maps are coming from the position of the empire, from the position of the power. And then to try to do like counter mapping, mapping from the position of the one who is being oppressed. And in a sense, like, me as a user of whatever I'm, I was investigating, I am the one who is being oppressed most of the time. So like, this is for me like really nice to have this idea of possibility that we can draw the map from the different perspective. So not from the perspective of power, but from the perspective of the, the, the user worker resource. And, but, but, but it's always, as I said, it's always like a play between, you know, uh, the, the cartographer as a narrator, as the one who is telling a story, because like cartography, it's somewhere, you know, also as a definition, it's in, in, in between science and art. And then it's question, you know, like, you know, this art part is basically making for me interesting cartography, but in the same time, the art part is this interpretation. This is the bias. And, uh, but I think it's super important to try. Even we know that it's not possible, even if we know that it's not precise, even if it's, it's really important to try to, to deconstruct complexity. Because like, complexity, it's, it's how they are defeating us. You know? Because there are a like, lot of layers of complexity, technical layer, you know, an open device, what's this? You know? And then even on that level, they are trying to, to, to there is like a whole movement of open schematics, like people who are fighting for schematics to be open in, in, in order to repair devices. No? So this is one layer. And then there is hundreds of different layers within. And then the, 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 another really important 
thing from my point of view is to try to, to, to understand those kind of long views. So it's not ending in the data center, it's ending in the mind. You know, and then, then those long views have a, you know, it's also long, not so in the distance, but also in the time. And because those perspectives are telling us different stories, you know, different stories that are really important to understand the, the view that, for example, have uh, uh, Jeff Bezos. Because this is the view that he had. It includes Congo, it includes because, you know, he understands how the, the <laughs> real Internet of Things, when I say Internet of Things, I think real things moving around the world, how this is working. You know? So, and, and, and then, and even, even, uh, uh, even if it's not precise map, even if it's not, even if it, there is a lot of bias, even if there is a lot of interpretation, I think that every attempt matters. You know, to, to, to try to face this. You know, in, in other way, we are going to be just like in position of like a you know, consumer or like human being who doesn't know who is operating its own life. No? So, uh. so I have a follow-up question for you. So there's a little bit of an obsession sometimes with transparency, mm -hmm. right? And the idea that if we know, I mean, that, that this is, I mean, it's, as you say, it's not necessarily an accurate representation. It's not a complete picture, right? Um, but there is this obsession with, like, with transparency in general. It's kind of a catchword, just like I'm going to also ask you about the catchword of sustainability, right? Um, and I'm and just trying to think about, like, what are also the limits of that discourse? And, you know, like, how do you place, you know, this attempt at making these power structures more transparent within that? Hmm. Mm. There is a, like a, a bit, you know, uh, transparency is tricky. So like when I started to do uh, Facebook research, and I typing on Google like Facebook algorithm, like on first three or four pages of, but that was like 2000, I don't know, it was like 13 or 12, or something. and so the like few first pages of, of Google was filled by different marketing agencies trying to understand Facebook algorithm. So in that sense, like this algorithm being non-transparent, maybe it was not so bad idea. You know, because like, then all of those marketing agencies will will like dig up like ways how to misuse this this uh, algorithm. And then another another problem. But but we can as a society we cannot progress further in in without a certain amount of transparency because because we need to understand how like why we are seeing something why someone is like thousand times more rich than someone else why we need to to ask those questions another problem with transparency that it will need the new bureaucracy so just try to imagine like for example you have a I don't know, Facebook and Google. Like our commissioner for privacy in Serbia have no chance to, to cope with complexity of operation that they are doing. So in order to deal with that, you will need like a lot of lot of bureaucracy, like hundreds and hundreds of experts who are just trying to deal with the complexity and algorithms and, and, and effects of, of like what they are doing. But the problem is like the most most uh, uh, skilled experts are already bought. So with each day, we are losing our capacity to face, to investigate, even as a government or as a, as a individual investigators to investigate them, because like the, the I remember like when there was like some kind of big meeting of, of like NGOs in, in like this kind of. Uh, digital rights field in, in Europe, and then some, some uh, uh, big funder wanted to like, help, and I said, yeah, but we don't have enough, so if we just pay like one programmer for each organization of 10 organizations, we will need one million per year. So there, no, there is no one who can cope with the, with the prices of like experts, cyber forensics, everyone. So we are more and more like, you know, Still art, we can do it from the, 
art perspective, but uh, from technical perspective, we are losing the, the capacity to, to investigate. Interesting. And then I guess, I mean, going to that, it's like, I feel like just like transparency has become a buzzword, obviously sustainability has too, specifically in relation to the green revolution, which you guys have put into quotations in your project. Um, I know, for example, in Dubai, um, as, as we know, Dubai relies on desalination and the plan for Dubai for its water source in the future, because desalination is very carbon intensive, is basically to move to solar powered desalination. Right? So the idea is essentially that, that we, I, I, and this is a kind of movement towards being more green or sustainable. But as we see through your work, not so sustainable. So maybe if we could, if you could um, shed light on um, kind of how sustainability is being used and what real sustainability might look like. Yeah. And then we switch over. Uh, well, it touches on this transparency question as well. You know, I mean, it, you can imagine, of course, how things should be done, but it's so far away from how we've constructed society and how the economy works that I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. And people telling you that this is the solution, I mean, it, it, for me, it's just a blindfold. It's just a, a diversion. I mean, the, the whole economic system is built on inequality, on some having less uh, than others. That's how the whole system is being built. So if, well, if you want to make that transparent, OK, that's one thing. But it, I, I don't. I haven't encountered any technology now as a, as a replacement for uh, fossil fuel uh, driven energy. Not with this amount of people, not uh, with this amount of energy hunger that how we are living and consuming goods. Maybe somebody else has, but <laughs> I for sure have. Yeah. Um, well, so sustainability, it's a nice word, it, it works well, you know, but for me it's part of a greenwashing strategy to do more of the same with a different material. Interesting, thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions in the audience? Or a solution for the sustainability <laughs> yeah. problem? Well, there's a lot of things to tune in this like, big picture, you know, like starting from this idea that we have this kind of from one dollar per day to seven million per day. So there's a lot of things to tune and to make sustainable, not in a sense of like, like socially sustainable more, that we don't have such a big gap between like uh, different people that are part of this, uh, this chain. And then the, the, the second sustainability, it's like we most of the time discuss like technology from the position of relation between like human and technology, society and technology, but really rarely from the position nature and technology, and nature and humans and technology in the same story. And this is what we basically try to, to, to do with this map, to, to put the nature as well in, in, in this story of, of exploitation. So. And but, yeah, sorry, you also made me think of a, a calculator that is being used uh, every year to know at which date of the year we're out of our uh, natural resources that we yeah. need to go through the year and it's being uh, pushed um, forward uh, every year and right now we're somewhere in June if I'm not mistaken. So someone said yesterday like the price we are all sharing the, the, the costs and the, the you know the profit is going to one really tiny layer. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's not it's great. It's the, one of the things I've heard in my research here has been like that renewables are all about a discourse of abundance, whereas um, resources are about scarcity. So there's this idea that like basically solar power is infinite, right? But then the yeah. things that are undergirding it are still scarce, and yeah. that gets lost in some of the discourse I think in about renewables sometimes. Um, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a solution for sustainability, but it was the, it was the term transparency that kind of kicked me off a little bit, because uh, I also don't particularly believe in it. I, I agree entirely that just by sort of showing everyone that they're being evil doesn't, in any case, tend to make anyone less evil. Um, but um, but it, it made me think about the connections between a couple of things you showed. Um, particularly, I was um, 
incredibly struck by the um, the Lukasa memory boards, which I which I'd never seen before. Um, and and as I started doodling one badly, I realised it looked just like the AI map to me. That was the kind of the connection yeah. that I drew, and it made me start thinking of maps. It's interesting that we default to maps as, and cartography in these descriptions because then we start have to apologizing for them because we then have to say, oh, but you know, cartography is evil and it's, it's the tool of power and it's this kind of thing. Whereas what I felt was with the, with the memory boards, it was, it was very clear these were tools for thinking with and for thinking through rather than traveling through. They were kind of guides rather than descriptors. And so I guess the, a question that might come out of that is like, do we need to get away from this idea of mapping so directly and think of this more as a kind of guiding through certain processes and just a, a kind of mode of thinking and explaining where, where, where we already know the representation is either screwed or kind of beyond any ideas of transparency or that kind of thing? Well, yeah, it's, it's nice that you give the example of the, 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 the traveling through because the memory boards on, only came about um, when, when people stopped uh, migrating, uh, because the, the, the use of a memory device is, is, uh, is super old and is, is, is omnipresent. Um, um, but in, in, a, in a physical walking form, it's uh, not the, the little bits and pieces on the board, but it's certain rocks um, that, that open uh, a pocket of knowledge. Um, uh, the, 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 the longest uh, society that still uses this form of remembering is, is in, in Australia, eh, where people can uh, read the Uhuru by walking around and every curve in the rock is opening a different uh, set of, of, of knowledge. Um, it's a very interesting book by uh, Kelly Lynn, The Memory Code, who came with a completely new uh, interpretation of, of most uh, physical human remains, including Stonehenge, uh, they were actually memory palaces. And um, this, uh, the, uh, I, I think, I think uh, the first human explorers made a big mistake in the beginning when they were going around and, and documenting uh, um, uh, other cultures, is, is that they, uh, they immediately put their, their their way of uh, transmitting knowledge in superstition. And, and they were writing countless amounts of uh, stories about uh, hunting rituals where they dance around to, to bring luck for the hunt and so on. But um, what they didn't realize was is that, uh, well, they, they, they never had writing in such a way. So in order to, to, to keep huge amounts of information and experience and put it on, they had to rec recite it and, and, and redo it in, in ritual forms. But they didn't, because information was so valuable, it, it, your survival depended on it, they were not going to perform the actual ritual in front of a foreigner who didn't come with own information to exchange, which was where these big platforms and gathering uh, um, sites were for, was to exchange information or you could actually buy it. Uh, or they didn't understand it. So when they were dancing and doing certain movements, they were repeating movements you had to do from a certain direction with a certain amount of people against the wind to go and get this animal at that time of the day. And it, it's, it's full of very, very detailed information. And just by the constant repetition, which was interpreted as a, some kind of ritualistic dance, uh, they were able to uh, do this successful hunting. And instead of uh, looking at, at, uh, at that as an example or something that we could use either to make maps, because it's also maps ever to find water and so on, but based on, on actual experience and traveling through the landscape, or how to uh, memorize something which uh, is, is more depending on a verbal kind of transmitting of information, uh, it was just dismissed as a primitive uh, uh, culture, and yeah, we went our own way. But I think we should kind of, I don't know, maybe see if we can learn something from it, uh, because they have been around much longer, and they're certainly capable of surviving in environments without uh, necessarily destroying them in the way that uh, we do. There's another question back there. And do you want to add something? I don't know, about, uh, maybe just from, from really like a personal uh, uh, you know, like, uh, experience of like, uh, for example, there were those two maps, one pretend to or try to be like exact, to understand like what type of data, and 
it's completely imprecise in that way because it will never be that it's already outdated and so on. But the another one, the, the AI map, it's more abstract in a sense of like it gives you, it doesn't give you data, it gives you a key to understand reality. And in a way, this is probably why it's more for people like useful to do it. And it, it finds its way into like a school programs, into uh, academic courses, into museums, a lot of different places, you know, parliaments or like whatever. Because it doesn't give you like exact data, but it gives you a key to maybe make your own storytelling mm -hmm. or make your own investigation over some some complexity. And in, in this, that sense, I, I found that like more useful than trying to make hyper precise map of like data, numbers, you know, algorithms, whatever. It's more we are, we are dealing with non with our capa capacity to understand reality and how contemporary capitalism work. So in, in that sense, probably we will not get there through numbers, a lot of numbers. <laughs> we will get there through understanding how this shit works. You know? Sure. sure, sure. There's a question there and then there's another question over there. Um, so I just wanted to add a, a historian's perspective to all of this. Uh, this is a conversation really that's deeply rooted in our in a modernity moment. And if we go back to the industrial revolution, we have the Malthusian hypothesis about the scarcity of resources and uh, ex the ex uh, explosion of population growth. And this is also happening, uh, you know, the industrial revolution, but also if you, uh, shortly thereafter, we see the interest of black gold, which is oil. Uh, that really shaped the politics of a lot of areas around the world, specifically where we are right now. So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that, yes, we're addressing this in our moment, uh, but this is part of a conversation that, you know, began with a sort of to link it to your, your point right now, um, the capitalist structure and globalized economy. So it's, I just kind of wanted to add that to the conversation. So thank you. A big fan yeah. or, or like right. a certain period like 1850s till beginning of like 1900s. As, and I, 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 when, when we were doing this research on that map, I think I have like completely the same map for like that period because then we are speaking about like first transatlantic cables. We are speaking about all of those relations. You know, there is like a Babbage uh, analytical engine map uh, mapping the different workshops in, in London where the first you know computer is, is made and uh, similar to this one you know like but then if you you think Babbage map in like longer uh, 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 anatomy you will again come to to I don't know what the Belgians were doing in Congo that in that period or when or like whatever you know it, it's the same it, the, it's a completely the same map and I, the, my favorite story is about uh, the Guta Per Percha, that's fantastic. So it's like about uh, so when they 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 needed to when they made like a telegraph, they needed to make some kind of like to make it like uh, waterproof. And in, in a sense, this Guta Percha was like some kind of natural, uh, yeah, yeah, tar, some kind of gum that is uh, isolating the cable. You know? But in order to make like one kilometer of of transatlantic cable, they needed to cut, I don't know how many million trees in, in, in Malaysia. And basically for the transatlantic cable and few other cables from that years, like the, the, this type of the tree completely uh, uh, collapsed. So you have the same situation like providing the, the, the you know, transatlantic cable or cables that are connecting UK and of course India but in the same time exploiting the, the trees from like Malaysia and it's like it's the same same story. Using problems to yeah. solve problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same and story. using like, copper from Congo. Yes. Of course, of course. It's it's for which they never got credit. Yeah. But. Could I just add a follow-up question to that before we move to your question? I'm sorry. And my follow-up question is, I'm, I'm, I am trained as a historian too, and I wonder as well, like, what is the difference, right? Like, there are certainly continuities and there are certainly differences. 
um, in our present moment. And I'm wondering, we have these continuities where we see Belgium continues, I mean Congo, sorry, continues, <laughs> well, <laughs> Congo continues to be imbricated in these colonial relationships, right? Like here in this case, economic colonialism, right? And, you know, a source of resource extraction. We have in all forms, these forms of labor exploitation um, that have been made very clear by both of your projects, but what's different about this moment, I guess? And then maybe we conclude with your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think there is, mm, not so sure, but maybe like the layers of untransparency and complexity. I think that's, that's different in a sense. Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> but I feel that like the, because like we are so, you know, like this, this uh, feeling that we have when you're looking at the, you know, interface of Facebook, Google, all of those like application, it's so far away from like the, the reality of exploitation, so far away, so detached in a sense of like, we really don't get it. And, but I don't know, maybe like in, in, in the beginning of industrial revolution, they also had this kind of A in front of like uh, uh, this machine for making like, uh, I, I, I don't know. Okay, but for me, the important is uh, uh, for Congolese people, I don't know, for the rest too, uh, extraction or not, internet or not, uh, it's important to keep the cup of mind of research. Yeah, to do research, I'm, I'm telling uh, every day in Congo, we need nothing. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe at least uh, uh, just ship and, and pen or, or pencil. We can do a lot of a uh, lot of research, and that uh, my my wish for 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 Congolese uh, because maybe most engineer um, philosopher the cup is mining now extraction, but it's it's wrong completely. Yeah, maybe we have to keep education and the rest. Uh, yeah, uh, correctly. Yeah. Maybe. Question. Yeah, so I have two very uh, short statements to preface a question to you specifically because you mentioned the inability to um, change anything because of the lack of financial capital. So the, the two statements that I think that, that, that have come to mind for me is that collectively we've forgotten or are ignorant of two things, technology preceded science, technology as a mode of being. We, we were, were preoccupied with the instruments of technology and have forgotten that we are actually the technology. And then the second thing that we've forgotten is, is when we talk about maps, we have to talk about mathematical cognition. And one of the, one example of mathematical cognition would be the quantification of people, places, and things people or places specifically in the form of a map. And when we look at mathematical cognition, that information that is collected by any one of those tools is always for the benefit of those in power. It's never for the end user. So with that being said, if we lack the financial capital to enact change, we see a transition to the fostering of social capital, okay? If that is not enough, are you afraid that this revolutionary movement would have to involve force? Well. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know, I think there is like, a, I will sound like, yeah. there is a lot of different forces. And like, um, for example, like today we had discussion about like, uh, that not doing it's kind of like form of force as well. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So not participating and not not creating data, not like being part of this speed, not being you know. But by not doing, maybe we can do something. But it's maybe one of possible scenarios. And I like I think there are like several different you know we can. One possible way is to build new systems that will be more, you know, like more fair. That's one option. You know, the second option is to try to make existing systems more, more fair. So this is like what governments are trying to regulate. Or like, da, 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 da. 
And the third one, it's not to use them at all and just to like, go to the woods and try to do some kind of neo uh, ludist approach to all the all the thing that I'm also, you know, kind of fun of in, in the sense of, of like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not like, mm, mm, mm. I know this is like not so nice to, to say, but I feel I really like to quote, uh, um, especially from my detective days, like I really like to, to quote Blade Runner. <laughs> and to say like my you know, job, it's not to see how they are like contributing and how the system can be good. My job is to investigate the errors, to try to deal with the problems. So I, I don't, in, in myself, I don't find capacity to project the good, but it's probably because I'm like, you know, I'm born in, in Serbia, I live like, I grow up during like three different wars and stuff like this, so I'm kind of operated of uh, uh, positivism. <laughs> and even idea that I can create like some kind of, we should do that, I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't have this. Uh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Is there, are there any more questions? I, one last question. Okay. If, if there are no more questions, I might conclude with just one, um, which is how do we stop this from becoming an us versus them, given the fact that like probably everybody here owns an, owns an iPhone, right? And I think that you kind of touched mm, on no. this. But, or an iPhone, a smartphone, some kind of smart okay. yeah, device, yeah, 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 yeah. a computer, yeah. right? Like, how do we, what can we do? <laughs> and because you, you I feel see, like eventually the conversation... Goes, a brand becomes yeah, the true. An, an object on itself. Well, I just feel sometimes the conversation becomes an us versus them type of situation. And, you know, where it's like capital versus labor, this versus that. And then we kind of, I mean, we lose our sense of agency within that polarity. Right? And it's important to think about things as polar, but it's also important to recognize our own positionality within that and our own agency. Right? And I think that you kind of addressed a little bit of that in, the previous, in your answer to the previous question. But maybe we can conclude by trying to think more about, like, you know, I mean, how do we stop this from becoming an us versus them so big we can't do anything about it, we become paralyzed conversation. And maybe like if people in the audience have an answer to this, I'm also open to that as well. Well, maybe it's not a polarity, maybe it's a hierarchy. And you can't eliminate hierarchy. So you have to use force. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but maybe wondering how this yeah, conversation yeah. is going. <laughs> I think it's also dangerous to pretend that the, the, the pyramid doesn't exist, you know. Like it's like kind of like not to discuss like the structure of the pyramid because then it's them and us, you know, it's them and us, yeah. But can we Deal look at both it? together? I don't know, I don't see them. I, yeah, but one doesn't never exist them. without the other. Of course, yeah, you so cannot so. just look at one, you have to look at both. They're part of the same pyramid. I think there's one last, do we have time for one last question? Or we're out, okay. So sorry, um, thank you very much everyone. Sorry, but um, we're gonna have to cut this short, but I'm sure you can ask the question during the break. Thank you very much to both of you.